Hey friends, welcome back to the Journal Feed. My name is Nick Zelt, and this is the only place to get spoon-fed the latest and greatest of emergency medicine. Now, if you are hearing this right now, then you are not currently a Journal Feed subscriber, and so you will not be receiving the full Journal Feed podcast, only getting a portion of the past week's articles. If you would like to get full access to both the podcast and the blog, then you'll have to become a member. All the details for that are journalfeed.org. And remember, we never want money to be a barrier to better patient care. So if you're having any trouble affording a subscription, just get in touch. We'll help you out. This is the audio version of the past week summaries, which this week were brought to you by Chris Thome, Aaron Lacey, Jason Lesnick, Megan Hilbert, and Clay Smith. I'd like to apologize in advance for the audio this week. I had some problems with my microphone. I actually had to re-record just the whole intro, which is why that part hopefully sounds better. But the rest, it's kind of rough. Sorry. Next week's and all following weeks, I will try to get back to my usual standard. But just hang tight with me for now. Sorry, guys. Okay, let's get straight to the third article. And then the third article. Titled, Effect of High-Intensity versus Low-Intensity Non-Invasive Positive Pressure Ventilation on the Need for Endotracheal Intubation in Patients with Acute Exacerbation of Chronic Obstructive Pulmonary Disease. The HAPPEN Randomized Clinical Trial out of the JAMA. Now, this is a very interesting study, which I think is applicable right away, but of course, try not to change your practice too much based on single studies. Just, you know, take that with a grain of salt as always. This was a multi-center RCT performed out of 30 hospitals in China from 2019 to 2022 that was able to randomize 300 patients who had COPD exacerbations. What they were randomizing them to was high-intensity non-invasive positive pressure ventilation or low-intensity. By high-intensity, I mean that they were increasing the inspiratory positive airway pressure, the IPAP, to obtain a tidal volume of 10 to 15 mLs per kg of predicted body weight, and being high intensity, they increase the IPAP up to 20 to 30 centimeters of water. For the low intensity group, they were aiming for more like 6 to 10 mLs per kg, and they limited their IPAP at 20 centimeters of water. What they wanted to know was using high intensity or low intensity, who was more likely to require intubation, which was based on both lab values and clinical features. What they found was a statistically significant difference in the number of patients who met their criteria for requiring intubation, about 5% versus 14% in the low intensity group. So there were actually 13 patients who, by their cutoffs, which were all reasonable, should have required intubation. However, only two of them were actually intubated. The reason for this was crossover between the groups. So if you were in the low intensity group and then you went on to require intubation, you crossed over to the high intensity group. And this is why the difference in intubation rates between the two groups was not statistically different. So to summarize that, there was less patients who needed intubation in the high intensity group, but there were equal number of patients who actually got intubated in both groups. And this, the authors presume, was because of crossover between the two groups. And this makes sense from an ethical perspective. It's a really fair way to design a trial, although it kind of gets rid of your, some of your equipose, and it weakens the trial itself in terms of really being certain of the efficacy of your intervention. But I understand why they did it. I just hate to presume this kind of thing when you've already gone through the effort of doing a big RCT. However, this is applicable to patients if you have severe COPD exacerbations that need positive pressure ventilation, then it's quite reasonable, I think, given that the complication rates were equal between the groups anyways, that you just be a little bit more aggressive and you can go for the high intensity approach, if they require it, of course. So in a spoonful, it takes a tiny bit of hand waving, but relatively little. This trial suggests that intensive positive pressure ventilation decreases the need for intubation in COPD exacerbation patients without an increase in complications. And then the fifth and final article titled Small versus Large Bore Thoracostomy for Traumatic Hemothorax, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis out of the Journal of Acute Care Surgery. Now, I don't need to tell you that if your patient has a hemothorax, a pneumothorax, or a hemonumothorax, that you're going to be very tempted to put a tube in their thoracic cavity. As for what kind of tube you should be putting there, or rather how big that tube is, this has been up for debate. Classically, of course, any traumatic hemothorax, you're going to be putting a large bore chest tube in there, at least a 20 French, and you're going to do it by thoracostomy. 
However, more recent data seems like we're moving towards small bore tubes, pigtail tubes. For pneumothorax, I think this has really kind of proven itself. Unless you have an unstable patient, put a pigtail in there. It's probably going to do the same thing. It's going to be well tolerated by the patient. I'd rather have a tiny tube than a huge tube in my chest personally. However, for hemothorax, it hasn't been necessarily as clear. However, there has been some data supporting small bore tubes. So what if we get them all together? What if we do a systematic review, a meta-analysis? Then what does the data look like? These authors were able to find 11 studies, totaling about 18 and a half hundred patients with traumatic hemothoraces. Most of these were from blood trauma. When a small bore thoracostomy tube was used, this was a 14 French or less. And if it was a large tube, then it was a 20 French or more. Not sure what happens if you try to put one in in between those values. For how well the tubes actually work, there was no difference in the failure rates between small and large tubes. The complication rates were also similar, as was mortality of these patients. So it seems like the efficacy is pretty much the same. For patients who had small bore tubes put in, the initial drainage was actually more, which I'm surprised by. You'd think big tube, more drainage, but not necessarily. They got almost twice as much out of the little tubes. However, the little tubes tended to be put in a bit later than the large tubes, almost 24 hours later. So perhaps more fluid moved around. They might not be the exact same hemothoraces as the other ones. But hey, you know, more drainage for the small tubes. It's interesting. Patients also spent less time with a tube inside their thoracic cavity if they got a small tube. 4.3 days versus 6.2 days, also statistically significant. Now, I said overall the complication rates were the same. However, insertion-related complication rates were higher for small bore chest tubes. Now, most of this, I said 11 trials, was based on not RCT data. Only three of the trials were RCTs. So like I said, classically, large bore chest tubes used to be the only answer. But now I think pigtails, they seem viable. All of these tubes were placed in stable patients. If you have an unstable patient, that is a completely different story. You should, you're going to be putting a large tube in that patient. But if they are stable, then, you know, you might as well just put a pigtail. This is more data which pushes us in the direction of small tubes. In my local trauma center, it seems like the emergency department is pretty happy to put in small tubes. However, the trauma service, they're much more stuck on large tubes. With studies like this, pooling the data together, perhaps we're going to be moving more and more towards smaller tubes. In a spoonful, this confirms what some have already started to do in their practices, and that's that small bore chest tubes for semi-elective tube insertions for hemothoraces seems to be better, if not the same, as putting in a large tube. Okay, that's all the articles we had from this week. What did we learn today? Let's do a quick wrap-up. From the third article, the HAPIN trial, high-intensity non-invasive positive pressure ventilation may benefit your severe COPD exacerbation patients. If the IPAP levels are up to 20 and it's just not doing the job, then consider IPAPs up to 30 centimeters of water. And then finally, from the fifth article, small bore chest tubes do well in this systematic review and meta-analysis. Equivalent failure rates, complications, and mortality rates compared with larger tubes. However, the circumstances in which they were put were slightly different with small tubes tending to be placed later, probably because those patients were quite stable. Again, if you were hearing this right now, then you are not a part of the member's feed, and so you missed three articles from this past week. The articles that you missed were about what medical learners do to your efficacy. The IDSA presents to you some updates on intra-abdominal infection recommendations, and then some protocols for treating opiate use disorder with azalazine thrown in. Links to all the articles summarized can be found at journalfeed.org. Just follow the links in your show notes. Our goal here is for you to read less, learn more, and save lives, one spoonful at a time. Thank you.